Hello, everyone, to the first webinar of 2022 from Tesla Lab. Today, we want to share with you on relevant topics that keep our days busy. Uh, unfortunately, due to some circumstances, Dennis Lodgman couldn't tune in. So with you today will be me, Adrian Sminions. Uh, to briefly introduce myself, I'm managing validation process in multiple projects and ensuring that accuracy, as well as participating in data processing and analysis process improvements. And here with me today is my colleague, Eva. Hi, I'm Eva Rebecca Korolkova. I'm a, a project manager here at Tesla Lab, and uh, daily I manage multiple audio and video projects uh, that ensure functional and non-functional testing of different services. I also participate in different process improvement plannings and executions and also in lecturing. And with us today is also our another colleague, uh, Dominic. Hello, everybody. I call myself a passionate tech enthusiast. And ever since I've started working at Tesla Lab, I've been specializing in audio and video testing, specifically performance testing of short video, uh, sh short form video applications. And as you remember, we had a webinar a year ago that was held by our colleagues, Nikolai and Dennis. Uh, but this year, we have something different, because last year it was about the science of audio and video testing. Is that right, Adrian? Uh, yeah. Today we will speak about the past, um, present and future of audio video quality testing. Uh, if questions arise during the webinar, please note down the slide numbers, which will appear in the upper right corner shortly. And yeah, man, after I introduce the web webinar agenda. But before that, we also have to tell a bit about ourselves. We are a software quality assurance company that helps startups and Fortune 500 companies worldwide to enhance their products by providing a wide range of testing services. We have been in the industry for over 10 years, somewhat recently during the start of the pandemic, the audio video demand quickly rose for conferencing, uh, video call and communication applications, and we've already tested them. Hence today, we want to show and tell our perspective of what happened and what lies ahead of us. We've had past and ongoing projects with clients that are well known, uh, not only in the industry, but also in the world. And the audio video industry expertise has been shared uh, both ways to improve the end product and mostly the user experience with custom tools and industry renowned metrics and even by leading internal testing teams, we do everything that is in our power to help the client grow. Uh, in today's webinar agenda, we will have three big topics where we will try to cover and squeeze every bit of information that we can into the time and make sure everybody acquires knowledge. Today, the main emphasis will be about past, present and future of audio video testing. The first topic will be simulating real life situations, uh, which will be covered by Eva. And to understand the performance and test automation, it will be explained by QA engineer Dominic. Uh, about past problems and present solutions, as well as future of getting trustworthy results will be covered by me, Adrian. And now I'm giving my word to my colleague Eva. Yeah, so let's dive right in. Uh, first topic of today, simulating real-life situations. Uh, let's discuss some of the situations that we uh, encounter in our uh, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. So right now, it is time of change. So communication and entertainment is shifting towards the new uh, platform, which is the mobile as the new default platform of the use. And with the accessibility of those mobile devices uh, also has changed the usage. Overall, the world population has a much broader uh, access to smartphones. Even five years ago, only 50% of the population had an access to one. Now, this number has grown to almost 84%. This also shifts the overall usage and daily spent hours on each of the platforms available. As you see on the right, the data shows that daily hours spent on phone are almost twice as much as on the desktop. Because of it, overall usage is changed also in the internet uh, usage and overall in digital minutes. 
with developing countries having access to new digital devices, the choice usually opts to mobile device, as it is usually capable of the same things that the laptops can do. However, it is more affordable to the people. And because of such market shifting, vendors and different services try to introduce new features and adapt to the situation right now. For example, during the last years, new type of content boomed, short videos. Once the popularity of such content uh, become to enhance, many applications started to implement such features into their, uh, into their product. And so the new features also include video calling, audio calling, which are, were also quite popular during the last years to stay connected between each other. And such new uh, features and adapting to the situation can also bring the new challenges, not only for the vendors, but also for us. Uh, switching to mobile brings various challenges to the vendors, which includes software, hardware, as well as environment considerations. Vendors, of course, need to maintain the quality for the application on big variety of devices. Uh, switching to mobile means that we will have less capabilities of the hardware, even though devices uh, are being developing. Still, smartphones doesn't have the same battery and CPU as desktop, for example. Uh, similarly, with device portability, enhancing network reliability cannot be forgotten. And testing is a way to conquer the challenges. That is why we were hard in the past and continue to do so, to create and improve audio and video testing laboratories that can simulate the most realistic scenarios to ensure that the conclusions that are derived from testing address the initially laid out target or issue. It can involve the position in the market or an outlook of the direction that the product should develop in. Yeah, and to sum up what was, what was said, the market has significantly shifted to the mobile usage, and that is the main point here. So, so has the intention of the developers and of testers. But the term mobile and smartphone is not as simple as it seems. There are different platforms that has to be supported. While, for example, US market is uh, dominated by the Apple manufacturer products as the top five devices used, worldwide Android is still more used platform overall. And the Android operating system is also modified by different manufacturers to suit their needs. Also, the new mobile phone models and other portable devices are coming out almost every single year. New innovations and technologies uh, actually expand and shift the ranges of the mid-level, low-end and high-end devices, adding new varieties of different models into the mix. Which brings us to cross-platform difficulties. Compatibility for the cross-platforms is an important aspect of modern application. It has been a challenge in the past, not only for the vendors to ensure the standard of quality on different devices and operating systems, but also for us as testers. It meant a lot of more devices, a bigger variety of devices that needed to be tested. However, from experience, the focus in testing is usually done on one side or other. Uh, the Android to Android calls, for example, or iOS to iOS calls. However, with expanding functionalities and client base, such a pro approach might not be the most suitable. So let's be realistic here. No one can afford the time and the resources to test every single device, every single platform. So what approach would be more suitable? For example, while testing call services and conference applications, we suggest uh, testing connection 
uh, and quality on different device pairings. Trying the connections between different platforms can show underlying issues that, are, that come up to the surface. Establishing baselines this way, we can also introduce new real, real devices that are outside of the top most used ones for the application. Testing the devices outside the top five or top 10 can show that the quality is maintained also on the devices that are not so popularly used. Cross-platform testing can ensure a broader audience is supported for the application. Another point today is that not everything goes to plan. For example, I am outside and I need to be in a meeting. Car noises are in the background, wind is in my face. The lighting is not the best, for example, because it's evening. And I have a simple phone and simple headphones. So such scenarios lurk in the shadows as to use the meeting and be able to hear what is happening and for us, others to uh, hear me, we need to ensure that the bad lighting and background noise is taken into account. So to test such approaches, we suggest creating more complex test scenarios, not only focus on network limitations and objective metrics, but also inserting subjective evaluation as part of testing. That could ensure that the subjective uh, opinion and different perspectives of the users are taken into account. Also, expanding on the topic, more real devices can show the hardware differences and uh, applications ability to adapt to these devices. Next point of today, for simulating real life situations is multi-device support. More complex scenarios can be achieved this way. And when it comes uh, to multi-person calls, there are many different architectures, technologies, solutions that are used to provide the best quality in the call and also to utilize available services in the best way um, it is possible. Some which choose to utilize device resources more, some which utilize server resources more. Many of them might be simple on paper and as an idea, but the tricky, uh, but they might be tricky to implement correctly and also requires testing. And today, the example would be simulcast. For example, in this picture, you can see an architecture of simulcast and, uh, and SFU combined, where you can see that the uh, simulcast technology deals with the problem when network availability between the users is uneven. Instead of the degrading the whole call, simulcast just um, create, uh, receives from the sender multiple copies of the video in different resolutions and different quality and ensures that each recipient receives the quality that they can maintain with the environment and capabilities that they have at the moment. Right now, the default test case is testing one pairing of the devices, one sender and one receiver. We observe their behavior, uh, create object, uh, objective metrics from the files and from the tests, and ensure that we show results to the clients. We also add virtual participants and maybe more real devices to ensure the numbers in the call if the group calls are needed. However, such approach is not suitable for the, for example, simulcast testing. It would show only one speaker and receiver with a specific network limitation. So overall, it would show only one portion of the whole call and it would show only one perspective. That is why right now we're implementing solutions and working towards the multi-device support testing where more than two devices are observed. But the call 
uh, but that is not all. Uh, such uh, support allows us to create individual network conditions for each participant and observe the behavior that, uh, that they show. Such setup also can uh, maintain more complex uh, solutions uh, and more complex scenarios such as conversations and different videos. Overall, uh, such setup uh, can create diversity in the results. We can observe multiple perspectives in the same call. For example, here we can see two graphs uh, which show video frame rate. It is the same call, but different participants. These are all work time graphs. On the horizontal axis, you can see the seconds, and on the vertical axis, you can see frames per second. Overall, one receiver on the left is limited to 250 kbps. However, on the right side, the receiver has unlimited network and in general good network conditions. As you can see, in the same call, two different qualities arise. For the limited receiver, you can see that the frames per second are more uh, unstable, um, more frequently changed with the bigger range of the change. And overall, the average frames per second would be lower for this call than for the receiver that has unlimited network. So only limited receiver is affected, while receiver with a limited no network is able to watch the video with a good frame rate. Yes, and the same thing happens for not just frame rate, but for video quality as well. For example, if one cannot take the full uh, bandwidth, then each receiver gets the copy that is appropriate to their network capabilities, which means the quality is lower only for the limited receiver. For uh, the device setup in uh, testing, it is fully complementary to have a network environment that is fully made for testing. The outcome can be completely different if we just change one number in the script. So let's look more intensively at the situations we might found ourselves in. Each of us lives through different situations every day. For example, when uh, Eva could be late for work, where I could uh, catch a random jitter, jitter loss uh, or a packet loss. From bandwidth being restricted or changing too frequently to a random burst of packet loss or and increased latency, jitter is also there and it cannot be forgotten. It is the unfortunate thing that can cause a call to be delayed to a point where it is absolutely not possible to com communicate to one another. So right now, the most popular test case is a simple network limitation or packet loss, that's it. However, the real issues can be often found within those complicated network scenarios that might be missed. From right now into the future, we look at this differently. Yeah, so network emulation is part of the complex infrastructure that allows us to create very specific network environments that can be adapted to different situations, whether the delay, bandwidth, or packet loss, jitter, whatever the issue you want to investigate, it can all be recreated with the uh, accurate network emulation. One of the interesting scenarios that is becoming more popular right now is changing network conditions. When during one call, network environment changes multiple times. Such changing scenarios can show interesting behavior and how applications can adapt to such environments. Here we can see uh, another overtime graph example. So here, we had two applications and one test case. Available network for the participant um, was, uh, changed from 500 kbps to two, uh, 250 kbps to 100 kbps every minute. 
and then it went up in a similar pattern. Uh, again, on the horizontal axis is the time in seconds, and on the vertical axis is the receiver bitrate in kilobits per second. So application one in the, uh, on the left has been optimized for such changing environment in a way that it drops rapidly uh, used network once the bandwidth is lowered. However, once it is increased, the application tries to adapt as fast as it can to gain the maximum out of available bandwidth. On the right side, application two is not really optimized for such usage or has been developed in more cautious manner. Uh, right here, it uses in the beginning the same amount, which is 500 kbps as the application one. It rapidly drops the used uh, bandwidth once the availability also is decreased. However, once it reaches the lowest point, which is 100 kbps, uh, uh, once the network is um, more uh, is enhanced and the bandwidth is increased, it still stays at its lowest point and only very gradually starts to increase at the end of the call. Such optimization choices have direct effect on frame rate. As you see, application one on the left um, has problems with the frame rate only on the lowest point of the call, which is 100 kbps. Once the bandwidth is increased, it ensures that the frame rate is also optimized and uh, regains the starting point. However, for application two, that was more cautious in their decision. Once the frame rate has dropped, it stays at the lowest point, similarly to the bit rate. So overall, whatever the approach is chosen, it has direct effect also on the quality of the call. So next level for us, the future path, would be to create more accurate network emulators that support even more complex scenarios and more complex combinations of different network issues. Using electromagnetic shielding as a part of our laboratories could ensure that the outside traffic and noise in the environment does not affect our tests directly. Also, accurate cellular network emulation indoors could be created to ensure that different blockers such as walls do not stand in the way of our tests. And uh, lastly, IPv6 network testing also could be introduced in the future. And lastly, from the simulating real life situations, let's talk about content. Everyone uses the application differently. For everybody, even though the application stands for um, some typical content, for everybody, uh, the application suits the different purpose. For example, for one person, uh, a YouTube video might be a simple speech in front of the white wall. For the other one, it could be a platform to enhance their cre creativity through dance in a very colorful and vibrant studio. However, when such differences in the content are not taken into account, the issues overall may arise. However, we can test even that. By creating custom content to suit different scenarios and adapting uh, the metrics accordingly, we can ensure that we have a new variable in testing. Testing different content in the similar environments can show and uh, can show the difference in the application behavior when different contents are used. And also testing uh, this content and the difference in it ensures broader audience coverage as, again, for everybody, application has the, it, its own purpose. So let's uh, see some of the content types 
uh, that I'm talking about. For example, screen sharing. On the left side, you can see dynamic screen share, where a person uh, screen, uh, screen shares a gameplay of Counter-Strike. Uh, to ensure that the game is watchable by the viewers, it needs to maintain a bigger frame rate, which is the bigger, biggest uh, difference between dynamic and the static screen sharing. Because on the right, as you can see, by static, we mean a simple presentation, which could be watchable even with five frame rates per second. So vendors need to take into account that the screen sharing might be used for different purposes. So the availability uh, to save the resources and ensure different frame rates for such uh, content can be advantageous. Color, from our experience, also is quite a big factor for the content. Here on the right, you can see a very colorful video with the dance in the middle. So it's quite dynamic, it's quite colorful. On the left, you can see a more dull video with dull colors, person is sitting and not moving that much. But how color can affect something? Here is the example from the application that was not really optimized for the difference in content. Here we can see a test case where 500 kbps limitation is applied. On the left side, you can see the quality over time for a colorful video in the call. And on the right side, you can see a dull video quality. And here we can see at least slight difference. Colorful video has more frequent changes in the quality and overall the value is lower than for the dull video. So here, color makes the difference. And lastly, today, uh, about the content audio. So in the past, narrow band was more popularly used as it, uh, uh, as it needed less available bandwidth. However, the quality was not the best. Uh, that is why with enhancing availability of network and enhancing capabilities of the devices, vendors are now opting for wideband and super wideband content. This ensures that in the call, we can hear accents and, and distinguish different voices. However, in our opinion, the network capabilities and device capabilities are enhancing so rapidly that soon uncompressed videos, uh, uncompressed audio content will be uh, a norm. And that will ensure a great quality, not only for music or concerts, but even for our regular calls. Yeah, regarding optimization and capabilities, we need to have a short yet deep enough look at it because right now there is a raised demand for large scale intensive load or overall performance testing. And the best way for most companies uh, seems to be to reach those goals, they want to use automation. But in some cases, although that is tempting, it is not the best option nor is it always possible. So for conference calls or large meetings, whichever way you may call the occasion, uh, these are very popular nowadays. The chance to call in half of the company for an announcement is not a rare occurrence. So the favor of an online meeting is quite logical. It is quick to set up, it is easy, does not cost much, if anything, and is convenient, yet it is more connecting than an email. So the challenge comes in, and it is quite, quite straightforward. How does one set up a call and deliver the results with the respective conclusions? Because there are several ways to go about these things. Or simply put, how do you do testing of large audience video calls? Well, yeah, the approach of uh, today and the typical investigation, uh, we use similar uh, simulated users that act exactly like real users through WebRTC connections. 
And for that, we used our own tool, Loadera. Well, we can combine the simulated extra users with regular uh, devices, uh, smaller testing setups, and also limitations to create truly massive scale tests. Uh, but recently, more and more clients have asked for the majority of the devices in the call to be real devices. Um, that would represent real users in a large scale tests, uh, and they see the value in that. So what you see in the example on the right uh, is a real testing setup that we had. A light mess, but uh, tightly monitored and quite difficult to set up to work correctly. We need to observe uh, performance on all ends and to derive better results and pinpoint improvement areas or investigation opportunities, even for such setups. I got a question. Uh, what kind of difficulties could pop up if, with that kind of setup that you can see on the image on the right side? That's actually a good question because difficulties do arise. Um, more devices often in tighter space need to be had. So it, uh, it means that more consumed network is in one space. So we need to uh, create a, a complex infrastructure in that place to ensure that the devices do not interfere with each other. It also means a harder test execution. So the tester needs to handle all the devices and gather all the raw data without missing some information and without creating a big delays uh, from the monitoring. And lastly, also data processing. All the data gathered, which is a lot bigger amount of data than in regular tests, it all needs to be processed. It all needs to be validated to draw conclusions, which calls for more effort into the processing as well. Yet, if we have done everything correctly, then we should arrive where we do not only show metrics that relate to the performance in the quality aspect, but also the more traditional sense, the utilization of the physical hardware components. Um, the change of the default device brings yet another challenge due to the way that the devices can utilize their internals. So a desktop would not care so much for the slightly higher usage of, of power consumption, but a laptop or a mobile device would, right? Uh, more CPU usage means more power consumption. That would mean more battery draw. Uh, more battery draw then brings more heat and that in turn, again, increases the battery and overall internal degradation speed. So the default methodology that we use to do is for performance testing is that the device does not have any third party applications except the one under test or the ones. Uh, all of the features or notifications that uh, could break the testing process are turned off, completely disabled. When the devices are prepared for the tests and uh, various activities are uh, executed, and then battery, draw, CPU, GPU, and RAM usage are monitored. And in the end, these results are reviewed by a qualified engineer, performance engineer, to ensure that they are logical and represent the testing activities. These metrics wonderfully complement the typical quality metrics that we get. So why is it so important? Well, even though, as I said, mobile devices can be powerful and technologies and hardware are evolving, the capabilities are still lesser of a PC. Uh, the challenge for vendors is to adapt the service so it can work on various devices in good quality. So testing hardware resource consumption is a good beginning to establish the baseline of what the application needs to work correctly. So after we can uh, do continuous testing effort, 
and then compare that same baseline and assess how the optimization attempts uh, make the de uh, device or the software react better. So here at Tesla Lab, we have created innovative solutions that are very simple to use and which, with which we can monitor the key performance metrics. So namely battery draw, RAM, uh, and CPU and GPU usage, whichever ones are required or applicable. A device may perform great in quality aspects, as in great video or audio scores, but the issue may be found for exactly that reason. An overperformance could be due to a higher, again, CPU usage. And then it's like a tumbleweed, it catches more and more along the way. So the ideal goal is to catch these issues and changes uh, in consumption during specific and more interesting different use cases so underlying issues can be found before they get to the users. So this type of testing is important because it can not only give observations and metrics on various features of the application, but also validate the hardware optimization techniques used. In an ideal world, we can automate the entire process, of course, and simulate real world use case scenarios with simulated uh, behavior that mimics real users. Most people look at the premise and of course, it's an easy choice we do that. Automation is great, less human input, less money for more tests since they can run theoretically 24 seven. Yet multiple user tests can be a strong point of automation where additional uh, users can be added uh, through Lodero or uh, multiple Selenium instances where they cannot be real devices. But again, although automation is a huge part of audio and video testing, manual testing is not going anywhere soon. And here's why. Both manual and automated testing are great in their own right. But yes, if you are in it for the long haul, then automation makes more sense. One must keep in mind that having an automation setup means a considerable uh, initial investment, but that comes paired with the ongoing challenge that there could be notifications that cannot be disabled, UI changes in the testable uh, applications that may come with weekly updates that result in constant code changes for upkeep. So you couldn't just make it and leave it. Uh, there are cases where prolonged intensive automated testing can lead to memory shortages or battery overheating and then thus resulting in very quick device degradation. So our own automation solution uh, to address some of these challenges is our own develop, developed common line interface tool called Testray. The open source tool allows us to create easy um, automation pipelines to test UI for browsers, namely Chrome or Safari, among others, of course. It can also be used for both Mac applications on desktop and Windows devices, uh, just as it can be used for Android or iOS efforts. But uh, Dominic, what are the advantages of test ray? Well, okay, that's a good one. Okay, the reason is, in our view, it makes by far the most sense. It is very easy to create those new automation pipelines, as I've said. It has fantastic cross-platform capabilities, so it gives us that flexibility, right? Uh, we can do Android to iOS, sure, or we can do Windows to iOS, or we can do Mac to iOS, or whichever combination imaginative thing that you can think of. Theoretically, you could take all of these platforms and run them in a single test scenario. So you can create reusable modular blocks for uh, uh, like starting the call, recording, uh, analyzing the data, and with quick, easy implementation of multiple drivers, 
that can be synchronized and run in parallel, uh, the built-in Cucumber reporting will also help with logging through terminal or log files. To top it all off, it is very quick and easy to install due to the documentation that is available. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Dominic, for explaining the performance test automation. Uh, getting trustworthy results is one of the most uh, important things in audio video department because on these these results, millions of users are dependent on how the company potentially change and upgrade the application to achieve better user experience. And first off, we'll start with reliability of metrics. In the past, we had different life issues, uh, which we eventually evaded by getting together qualified QA engineers. Uh, one of the biggest matter in audio video testing, especially when you have a lot of laboratories is infrastructure and the way you create and manage it. Mainly the past problems uh, we had was with network interference, which leads to packet loss, unexpected delays and or bandwidth troubles. And as the demand increased in audio video testing during the pandemic, shortage of storage space and performance issues lead to thinking of ways how we can brew it as well. Regarding tools and scripts, the main difficulty is that everything needs to be adapted. You can't really rely on public started image quality models or implement VMF based on the public accessible information. Uh, by testing group calls, conference calls, we run into various call layout problems. For example, 20 users join into the call due to poor bandwidth limitation. Uh, one of the users disconnects, and after disconnection happens, user rejoins the call, but is placed into a different position. Also, we encountered untrustworthy time series results for some of the metrics. And during the testing process, we have encountered issues by writing traces on the testing devices itself. We tried to lower the video bitrate to save space and storage to increase as well performance. And by increased demand, as I mentioned, how do you video testing? Uh, we experience uh, untrustability of files in combination with insufficient document upkeep, which resulted into a lack of some engineering knowledge in audio video testing field. Uh, Doppler's domain probably question is how we did solve the solutions today for the infrastructure. So what we did, we migrated to dedicated access points with not overlapping frequencies. Also, we switched from semi-professional equipment to high-end equipment to mitigate the risks of different component complications. Uh, by switching to centralized network storage, we increased the performance and space. And to separate the infrastructure even more, we created the dedicated networks in each of the offices for different department types, depending on the necessity. Uh, by researching tools and script solutions, firstly, we trained image quality model algorithms to perform more accurately. Uh, then we did some adjustments uh, for the public WEMAF for specific audio video testing use cases. We encountered in precise time series data, as I mentioned before, and by thinking of solution, we came to the idea that we can take as a base QR codes and calculate the precision to indicate how precise our FPS readings actually are. So we created a success rate indicator to acquire more precise data. And last, we began with adapting various algorithms to custom content. Uh, to achieve the best testing process, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, switched to dedicated access points with not overlapping frequencies and started to capture the network data by using the TCP dump. We implemented in our file storage unique IDs for better traceability of the files. Also, to ensure the highest quality, we screen record our tests with the highest possible quality of label. We also have a dedicated documentation management specialist who upkeeps all the documentation. By proceeding to our improvement on FPS side, we have a success rate indicator. And as you can see, the image on the right is in poor quality and the QR codes are quite blurry. In the past, we didn't really have a way to indicate if frames per second is imprecise. So what we did, we actually created the simple success rate as a proportion of data points, where delta is less than two and total count of data points. 
uh, normally the success rate should be higher than 95%. If we get below that, the automatically report is generated and we try to investigate what we need to do to adapt and achieve better frames per second readings. Uh, for the WeMap, we wrote the pipeline to use and grade YUE files. We initially wanted to make an opt to choose uh, PNG, but we choose YUE files because it's faster and the CPU load is much, much less compared to PNG extraction. And also by introducing and using YUE files, we don't have a risk of introducing any loss in quality. We also made the region of interest detection logic along with automatic cropping and scaling. Uh, with these adjustments made, the results out of it are much more closer to subjective results. Here on the right side, you can see a graph where we compare it quite to the risk. For the future upgrades, uh, in the future, we look forward to create a standalone laboratory with automated test capture and also introduce new video quality assessment methods. And uh, one of the main things is human factor decreasement as much as possible to have fully automated processing, validation, and as I mentioned, data capturing. Uh, for the upcoming foremost thing is data analysis. <clears throat> By analyzing data, we can understand and pinpoint the potential app performance problems and uh, improve user experience. In the past, when we just started our journey in audio and video testing, the lack of metrics reflected on the analysis we made. For example, we used only Brisk and Polka to do our conclusion. Uh, fast forward to the date present, we are driving conclusions from various different metrics. Uh, for example, full reference, Brisk, Polka, different network metrics, which we're able to extract. Uh, for the future, we look forward to create automatic processes and automatic data analysis reports, which we can share on daily basis with our clients. Uh, here on this slide uh, for analysis of metrics, we will take a changing bandwidth limitation that lasts 420 seconds and is split into seven limitations, which changes after each 60 seconds. We need to remember that underneath the overall scores and averages always are time series results. On the screen, you're able to see four different applications and four different metrics. Starting from the upper left, we have frames per second, and then we have risk, and on from the lower left corner, we have CPU and receiver bitrate. By looking at the FPS, we are able to see that application one has low frames per second, and forwarding to the next, graph, we can notice that it has splendid video quality. But uh, next, interestingly, the question arises, how does the network perform? Uh, as you can see in the lower right corner, it has the most network usage, but how is it possible that we have high network usage, but still not up to 5 PS? So if we look closely to the CPU, we're able to see that CPU is fully throttled and is impacted potentially. Uh, that's my best guess, is unfavorable bitrate distribution. Uh, sorry about that. So level of detail. Uh, we also can compare and analyze competitors in various metrics. Here, for example, we can see a level of detail for application four and application three. Uh, for the application four image, observable is complete loss of details and blurriness. From such a poor quality, the user experience is unsatisfactory. And uh, for application three, which is limited the same way as application four, we can be held a splendid and good video quality. For the application one, by going forward, uh, we are able to acquire average results uh, based on the time series data points. Average graphs help us visualize the direction of conclusion and show our clients how the application performs versus other competitors or themselves in different versions. If we look at the left graph, a left vertical axis represents FPS, which goes up to 30. The right vertical axis shows us CPU usage as percentage. On the right graph, we can see network, uh, which goes up to 3,000. And on the right side, we can see CPU usage as well. From these two average graphs, we're able to draw conclusion that application one uses the most network, has the least FPS. And by investigating four more, we can observe high CPU usage. So final potential region, what to do is the application, firstly, could optimize the CPU usage for the app and also optimize the bandwidth usage. 
All right, we can derive that the application one is not for the masses, but from these four applications, which one would you say has the better performance for an average user? Uh, good question, good question. So the best user experience uh, from my subjective opinion can be absurd on application three based on these graphs, uh, which has the lowest CPU consumption, uh, good network bitrate usage, and uh, overall, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, on this slide, we can see that it has a great adaptability towards the changing bandwidth limitation. It greatly adapts to the limitation that is changing. Uh, if we go forward, for the analysis outcomes based on analysis, uh, we are able to adapt existing algorithm methods to so different type of content. Also by analyzing data, we create and ensure that the metrics are more flexible and reliable. Uh, by capturing and analyzing data, we can implement solutions that uh, can point out outliers. Also by correlating different metric data, we can see average daily, weekly, monthly trends of application. Uh, next topic goes hand in hand with the data analysis, which is validity of results. We need to make sure that the data we acquire is valid. And due to the pandemic and the increase in audio video testing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we had various past difficulties. One of the first is validating the data only at the first stage of testing. We had large amount of human directions, which uh, lead towards inefficient traceability of procedure and data. We also encoded uh, poor product quality assessment methods for different use cases. Uh, the present solutions are that to mitigate the risks of human uh, interaction, we actually automated network data processing completely and implemented JIRA into audio and video testing by creating a custom workflow with automation. We also started to research and develop automated video processing. And by researching various video quality metrics, we started to develop our own TZL video quality assessment method, which is based on neural network. And uh, next up, we have automated validation, which is split into four types, uh, four main, types are generic, network, audio, and video. Generic validation is where we basically validate the overall raw data, which is which could be app version, IP addresses, uh, timestamp when the test occurred, and cross-check the timestamp between different file types uh, or any other app-based specific data which can be obtained at the first stage of testing. Uh, next up, we have the network where we take network road traces and process data and then check whatever the bitrate values are present. We do checks for bitrate against the limitation applied to the testing scenario. Uh, we also validate if there's any junk traffic, let's say, that can occur, for example, uh, during a MacBook update or any other phone updates that could lead to potential uh, testing uh, issues. Also, we check for partnership IP addresses uh, audio, next up we have audio validation, uh, where we have simple checks, uh, whatever the data is present. We also check average values against the test. And uh, if the poll case expected range, for example, when there's no limitation applied at all, does the poll case even high enough? Uh, for video side, we have data point value check, whatever everything is present and processed. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we have success rate validation uh, for FPS. Then we also draw a correlation between various types of video data metrics. Also, we calculate the confidence levels for each of the metric of the video side. To ensure the quality of the data, we have divided the process into three stage principle. First stage is called manual data capture, where we mainly monitor the network consumption directly from the root interface. Uh, we do bulk score analysis right away after the test run finishes. In the second stage, while processing the data, we have a simple raw data and process data checks where we spot the inconsistencies inside the metrics. And when the captured raw data is processed, it is handed to the third stage where the data analyst takes over. The data analyst has to make sure the data is consistent and logical. Uh, we also question abnormal results and make notes and proceed with additional investigative test runs to determine what was the cause. Uh, for the future, in the future, <laughs> we look forward to analyze deeper the WebRTC and use it in combination with DCP dump uh, network data and do cross-checks between them. 
Also, we try to automate the analysis of RTP streams. Besides that, we keep upgrading Jira workflow even more to acquire fully automated reports on daily basis and provide potentially access to dashboards with different visualized graphs, uh, weekly, monthly, uh, basically on needed time period for the client. On video side, we will work on audio spectrogram analysis. And once we have done all of this work, we have yet another challenge, which is visualization benchmarking. And now I'm giving my word to my colleagues. Yeah, visualization and benchmarking is an idea that is difficult to accomplish perfectly. Uh, data needs to be shown in a way so everybody can understand it, right? From product engineers to project managers to marketing specialists, all of them need to understand what has been accomplished through testing and how their application performs. Uh, design teams work together with uh, project managers and team members on our side to deliver the most visually pleasing presentation deck that also encapsulates the most information possible. Uh, data accessibility is also becoming more important. Yeah, and the benchmarking uh, together with competitor analysis uh, has become uh, quite a popular way in how we perceive the data. So the reason why many companies and vendors choose to do testing is not only to understand where their product stands in terms of quality and performance and whether the standards are accomplished, but also to understand where the product stands against the competitors. And uh, this type of analysis creates understanding overall of the quality of the product together with the closest competition and how they um, differ from one another. And where are the weak links for one application? Where are the weak links for the other application? We need to pinpoint the overall areas that could be improved based on the industry averages or simply to, the, uh, to reach the objectives of the vendors. Over a period of time, uh, we can look at the results and derive uh, the trend towards which the application strives. Um, it could be various, uh, e either growth or regression. However, comparison aspects and overall scoring can be used to derive overall quality assessment over time. For example, if we want to do a competition analysis, we can do it in different terms. We can compare the application, how they behave in different network speeds. So we would do the comparison in that. Also, we can compare uh, the behavior on different platforms. For example, Mac and Windows or iOS and Android applications. Also, we can test and compare different features that the application have. For example, calls can be in gallery view or dominant view. And comparing the applications, how they uh, adapt to the features and how they implement the features overall can help understand um, the quality of the product. Also, we started to incorporate scoring system into our approaches as well. Scoring systems overall are a much simpler benchmark uh, presentation and data visualization. It is much more understandable than endless metrics because it combines all the metrics, assigns the scores to them, and also uh, ensures that we have one cumulative score in the end. It is much more understandable, and over time, it can show a trend trend line, whether the product is improving or regressing. Yeah, and while on the same way, we can not only adapt our scores and the conclusions to better represent the data that you're looking for, but also adapt the way 
the way the data is given back to the client. Uh, if the client wants just raw data to continue that to their research or uh, analysis departments, we can do that. It is no problem. Or we can, we might as well can do just beautiful graphs on a neat website that show basically the end result on few clicks of a button. So these are all just options and we need to create common ground. We have to listen to the client's thoughts and the goals they want to achieve, of course. And we ourselves have to be open-minded and willing to improve and each time deliver something that matters. Uh, make it so the main idea behind the derived results reaches the broadest uh, possible audience of minds. Uh, make the end product matter not only for the client, but also for ourselves so we can learn and feel more appreciated. And it may sound a bit unnecessary, <laughs> but a sense of accomplishment is a good thing to have. So let's be smart, be direct to the point, wrap things up neatly. And now there are a couple of things I want to go through to summarize what we went through. So the world is changing and so is changing the way we test audio and video uh, solutions. Uh, time of change and possibilities. We look at the past and we try to predict where the technology will strive and we take the best parts and uh, join them in our testing solutions. All of the things that we talked about are just some parts that are involved in testing. And in this, just as important as testing data gathering, as the testing data gathering process uh, is the process of data analysis, is the testing process itself. All of this is an evergreen topic in the way that our and everyone's understanding on, on the topic will grow through time. To further emphasize, we will continue working hard on all of this. And we have more webinars that we're planning to do. I give my thanks to everyone here that tuned up. And uh, now we are going to hold the question and answer session. So you can go ahead and answer, uh, type in your questions through the chat, or if you feel like it, uh, we are now going to allow you to be unmuted and you can use your voice and we can go through your questions one by one. Feel free to ask about anything regarding the topics that we talked about today. And I myself or one of the colleagues, we will try to provide the best answer that we can. And uh, actually, we already have one question that was asked during the uh, webinar. And the question came from Susanna and it was, how deep of a knowledge of programming you need to have to start working on test automation? Well, the more you know, the more sense it will of course make, but uh, to start off with some basics, you can use your own device, you can use basic scripts that are on the internet and it doesn't require much input from yourself at the beginning. But of course, just like programming languages and everything, there's a lot to learn and to grow. So that would be my answer to that question. <laughs> so yeah, feel free guys to ask anything. Also, if the questions do not come to mind uh, right the second, uh, feel free to also take them offline reach to one of us through LinkedIn uh, or also email the test lab and we will try our best to answer your questions like that as well. And uh, remember to leave feedback as well about this webinar so we can work on and uh, make next webinar even better. So yeah, if someone has any questions, please ask. So. We can try and answer. Yes, if you have any particular topics that interest you, we can make in-depth dives into those in the future and try our best to answer them now. 
Uh, hello. So my name is Nikolai, and uh, in one of your graphs I have seen it was uh, brisk. I think uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I missed it. But can you can I, can you explain what is this brisk like uh, algorithm? Can we go to the? Did you note the uh, number of the slide? Can you find it, please? No, I didn't. Sorry. Let's uh, try to find maybe graph. Graph. Is it one uh, here? This one? Is it uh, this yeah. one, Nicola? Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, brisk is like blind references image spot your quality or later, and uh, it takes uh, it first what 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 we did in the Tesla Labs we take the video we split it up into frames and then we have a trained uh, algorithm of uh, a lot of uh, images a lot of images and uh, the value uh, is then added to these over time graphs. It's trained subjectively, if I'm not wrong. Uh, Richard, if it's, he's here, he can correct me. I hope that answers your question. Uh, any more questions from uh, anyone else? Yes, we actually have one more. It is from Ed Edward. So it was mentioned that tablet compatibility is a problem from our experience how much of an attention do big players actually pay to tablets do any of you want to elaborate on that or do i take this uh, uh, maybe i can take this so oh, yeah. hey, i'm richard uh, one of the engineers working on test lab actually from our experience the attention to the tablets is quite low uh, there are some, like, uh, some of, like, again, we can't go too much into the details, but some of the clients who are actually, like, uh, have, like, their application uh, suited for, for tablet, uh, tablet, uh, tablet uh, computers, uh, and obviously they have their, like, we do main, main of the testing uh, for them on, on such devices, but overall, otherwise, actually, it, they are like kind of left out uh, for most part. This is like kind of honest answer. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Richard, for questioning this. Uh, so we have another question in. Uh, how are you overcoming issues with manufacturers making changes to Android operating system? Uh, simply test on as many devices as possible, or you try grouping devices by some factor. So what we do, well, firstly, uh, for the manual side, we try to test these devices. Uh, we are not grouping them, we test individually. Uh, then we create some automated tests as well. And um, yeah, we all the time try to follow what uh, updates do our manufacturers make for the operating systems. I hope that answers your question. Um, also, like, uh, from uh, a bit of what was... Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, regarding the previous question as well, I remember that uh, uh, actually, we group them in the high high-end devices and low-end devices. So, yeah. for example, yeah, so that's it. We group them in high-end devices and low-end devices. Sorry that for interrupting the, you. Yeah, that is the thing I wanted to mention. So, it's yeah. all right. Uh, so, yeah, we group them also based on the capabilities where we divide, yeah, in the groups that uh, Adrian's mentioned. So, any more questions? You can also freely share your experience that you maybe have gone through in regards to audio, video quality, conferencing apps that maybe involve a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, another question, if we have time. Uh, 
uh, is uh, do you think in future if like we have now uh, 5G internet uh, speeds are getting higher do you think it will be still important to test with different network limitations so like every every part of world will have good internet like in 10 years um i would say that uh, it would be somewhat uh, naive not to be uh, in any way condescending but the progress is really rapid but it, i wouldn't say that uh, network coverage on a good level is happening in the nearest 10 or 20 years there are many many layers of issues that can occur and it's not just limited to high bandwidth it can also feature packet loss um high network density and uh, lack of infrastructure uh, for example the new west uh, 5g that is being implemented right now all over the world it might be somewhat of a curse <laughs> for in some cases uh, because the 5g infrastructure is not as strong as 4g infrastructure so the network speeds at the towers is amazing but uh, soon after when you go out of range it drops rapidly and it can cause issues when it changes the cell towers and so on so i would say there's a lot of tests even if there is a much better situation in 10 or 20 years regarding network if that, that answers the question okay thank you yeah. Um, maybe now one yet. Do you plan to make it as a product? Because from this presentation, I understand it's like a manual or like an automation, but it's not like really a product where, like, let's say I, I can ask to feed my video in and get results. So like a front end uh, website. Uh, any plans for that? Uh... Yeah, I think I'll answer this question. Yeah, we actually have uh, developing researching an app where our client can actually send it in uh, the test he wants and it will automatically uh, be automated and will give results out inside the web or application. Uh, we think it's uh, going to be covered maybe in the next webinar. We will try to create it as as good as possible and we will try to do it in i think a half year so keep tuned up for any updates and we will share our experience how we go on with this project yeah uh, any more questions from audience okay uh yeah, if uh, I'll, I'll just a reminder, if any questions arise after the webinar, uh, feel free to ask information by using contact form, which can be found on our website, testdevelop.com. And I think, yeah, thanks for tuning in. And we can actually, I think, end this session. Right, Dominica and Eva? How do you think? Yeah. Sounds like a plan of events. <laughs> But yeah, uh, thanks again, everybody, for your attention. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I hope everybody got something uh, new for themselves. Uh, and uh, yeah. And uh, you can ping uh, freely on LinkedIn, any of us, and uh, we will answer as fast as possible we can. <laughs> uh, so yeah, have a nice day, everyone, and uh, bye. Have a nice day. Goodbye.